Hop into your Bronco, hold on to your pancakes, and take a drive with us as we return to Haven for the last time this season. This is Troubled, your favorite rewatch podcast dedicated to the sci-fi channel show Haven based on the Stephen King novella, The Colorado Kid. I'm your first host in our father-son podcast, Alex French. Hi, and I'm Rich French, the best father since Darth Vader. Yeah, hopefully you throw an evil-robed man down a, a shaft for me. Your pathetic friends will die. <laughs> That's my Palpatine. All right. So like every episode, we like to start off with the summary. Just for those who haven't been watching, you can kind of get up to date without having to watch the episode. All right. So this one is episode 13, our series finale. Well, season one finale, not the series finale, thankfully. We've got a whole nother season coming up. Uh, the episode is called Spiral. To start this episode, it kind of begins where the last episode left off. So Audrey sits down on the beach and looks at the her, the scar on her foot where the glass had left a scar. Right, and she's uh, kind of asking God, you know, hey, what 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 you got next for me, <laughs> based on all of this. When uh, and a gentleman arrives in Haven and throws down a duffel bag which has Shawshank Prison on it, and then he approaches Audrey at the site and you know gives her uh, what you know sounds like some friendly advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he seems like a kind of nice guy, positive. Uh, w- what advice did he give her again? Oh, that that she would figure it out. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, some nice, would... helpful advice. Yeah. Of course. Then sa- oh, yeah. Well, th- th- but then he says, you know, so, you know, sometimes you leave a mark. Sometimes the tide washes his way, but you don't know until you come back to, to find out. So I thought that was a pretty neat line. Yeah. And maybe Max is a good guy. Right. And he goes uh, into Haven, talks to Dave. Yeah. And that's where we find that Max <laughs> isn't a good guy. As Max <laughs> goes into the Haven Herald and basically shakes uh, Dave Teagues down for, for a, a job, job. <laughs> that he feels he's owed. For some reason, which yeah, uh, Dave's scared pretty shitless, it seems, of Max. Definitely. And so there's clearly history history there. All right. After he's kind of a little unsuccessful with Dave, uh, he heads over to the Grey Gull and where he kind of treated the chief, you know, he eating a meal. I guess we found out where he's been all season, every episode, instead of working on cases, is he's, yeah. you know, having a meal at the Grey Gull and Max comes in and there's clearly some extremely negative energy between them. I, I like how Max says, uh, I'll have two of whatever he had. <laughs> yeah, that was a nice line. Uh, so they sit down and Warnos is like, oh, shit, you know, Max, like, why don't you, how, I didn't know you, I didn't know you got out of Shawshank, but you better get the fuck out of here. You better get out of Haven. You better get out of Maine. I don't want to see you again or I'm going to kill you or I'm, uh, or send him back. Does he, does he threaten to kill him or send him back to prison? He threatens to send him back. He doesn't yeah, yeah. threaten to kill him, but, uh, <laughs> but he wants you know, to, he hates him. He, he definitely wants to. But Max has got some sack. Tells him, you, you either shoot, kill me now or get away from me. And he's going to eat his meal. Uh, and the chief, you know, fucking storms off. And in the distance, as Max is kind of enjoying his, I don't know, uh, you know, return, the lighthouse in the back crumbles, right? Yep. A uh, crack appears and then the whole lighthouse crumbles, which makes Max smile. Audrey's at Haven PD, right? Looking into yeah. things, but she's not really feeling it. No, no, they're they're investigating, you know, all of the cracks around town, but, uh, you know, Audrey's lethargic and sluggish, tells Nathan she hasn't been sleeping. So Nathan basically says, hey, you got to go home. You're no good to me like this. And uh, Audrey agrees to go home. Yeah. Uh, And then meanwhile, Max is just making his rounds around town, right? Uh, Yeah. So uh, Duke's coming back probably from the store since he's got fresh flowers in his hands. I don't know who the flowers are for some international (laughs) mistress uh, somewhere, but uh, so he finds Max not only on the Cape Rouge, he's sitting in uh, sitting in Duke's chair. So uh, yeah, Duke. Duke Oh, go for it. Uh, Duke's pissed. Duke's like, you better get the fuck off. Get out of my chair. I don't like this uh max is like well i talked to this guy john in prison and he you know you owe him money so i'm gonna collect on that money or else you know if you don't give it i'm gonna beat the shit out of you and duke picks up a pipe is like well let's fight max is like well that's not very fair duke's like i don't give a shit until matt until duke starts thinking about it right yeah and then he realizes that hey you're that guy who killed that family 25 years ago So there's no way you're going to do something that gets you sent right back to prison. So do kind of, and he notices the tattoo, correct? And then he sees the maze tattoo on his left forearm, which is the typical spot. 
And now he knows something's up. But Duke's prepared because he's got his hand on a gun hidden underneath uh, like the, the bench next to him. So he's ready. If it's go time, Duke's going to be covered. Right. Um, meanwhile, Audrey's kind of holed up at her house uh, or at a house. Julia is kind of coming to cheer her up. And Duke's like, yeah, hey, I need to come talk. I need to talk to Audrey right now about the dude at the tattoo. And Julia's like, yeah, she's not really having visitors. I'm giving her a cupcake to cheer her up. Once you get the fuck out of here, I'll pass on the message. And Duke's, you know, like, ugh, like I got shit to do, but whatever. It, yeah, it's the over the way bread and breakfast. B- bread and breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Audrey comes out. Julia gives her cupcake, tells her the news. Audrey's just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, looks out at the ocean, right? But goes to town on that cupcake. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mad, mad respect for her cupcake skills. Okay, um, so Max is eating at the Grey Gall, and Audrey approaches him and asks him about going to see Duke and, you know, about his tattoo as well. M- Max clearly doesn't like the questions, but uh, they bu- he bumps the waitress, and the waitress spills coffee on his arm, but he doesn't even flinch. He makes a joke like, uh, thank God they serve cold coffee in this place, but Audrey is, is skeptical. Then he gets up to leave because he's uncomfortable with the tattoo talk, and uh, Audrey says, hey... Max, you killed the Colorado kid. And, you know, Max says uh, Gar- Garland Warnell's thought so, but he never proved it. So he kind of made it look like, yeah, I did it, but it never could be proved. Uh, kind of walking away from that scene, uh, we kind of pick up. Basically, this episode is just a lot of Max visiting people. Uh, Nathan's then investigating one of the cracks out there earlier. He had seen a, ma- a file with Max's name on it, but the chief was like, ah, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Get the fuck out of here. Go look at the cracks. So Nathan's looking at a crack in the ground uh, investigating when max shows up right uh yeah uh, Ma- max when he gets back to the bronco max is actually sitting in his bronco this guy just yeah. loves sitting in other people's seats yeah he, he knows <laughs> no boundaries kind of my style but uh they basically have a discussion um uh, max you know nathan's not happy As a matter of fact he tells him he'll send him back to shawshank or shoot him draws his gun <laughs> max is grabbing his shoulder and just smiling he's like you can't feel that huh you can't feel that at all and then basically says that you know he has friends you know it makes life a lot easier when you have friends so <laughs> yeah so audrey is now kind of concerned about what she heard duke is there they're talking to the waitress and duke's pissed at the waitress a little bit of being an asshole um obviously stressed out about the situation because he knows a person with a tattoo is destined to kill him when audrey kind of puts two and two together that he couldn't feel the coffee hit his arm even though it was scalding hot when she thought it was originally cold uh oh, this guy might have some ties to Nathan since they both can't feel things. Um, right, because the waitress mentioned it because she was afraid she was going to get sued or fired because she spilled scalding coffee on the guy. And that's what Audrey clicked two and two together. They must right. be related. Just kind of continuing with like Audrey and Duke's little investigation. Um, they go to talk to a doc hand that went, was in Shawshank with Max, correct? Yes, uh, Leo, he was uh, in Shawshank. Right. And so they're kind of talking to him about it. And Max was in charge of fights. Right. And he could win every fight because it was like he couldn't feel anything. Exactly. And he was returning to Haven for some long lost family is what he told Leo. Right. Um, Just from that, a little later, Audrey and Duke are kind of talking and Duke knows there's something wrong with Audrey, but she doesn't want to tell him and duke's like well what do you you got to tell nathan first and she's like yeah i got to tell nathan first and uh clearly duke you know stings a little for duke to hear right yeah but i but i think he, it stings but i think he understands yeah. you know he, he doesn't like it but but he understands it's the whole partner dynamic right and so kind of continuing max's uh rounds around haven and he now goes to visit Vince, the other T's brother. Um, and this encounter is very different than the one with Dave. <laughs> yes. Uh, he kind of comes up and Vince is not having his bullshit for one second. We see a much meaner side of Vince than we've ever seen before. Or a much more, I don't know, confident, aggressive, assertive version of Vince. The Vince I've been waiting all season for. The Lion Master. It's just like threat. Is he going to like... He, 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 oh, so, yeah, so, yeah, he yeah. starts off, Dave owes him. And he wants the life t- uh, taken from him back, and he wants to see the man who took it die. And then, uh, you know, and then Vince tells Garland, you know, he says, hey, Garland's not alone, and he and he needs to leave before Vince does something he really enjoys. <laughs> yeah, and isn't it implied that uh, Max tried to kill Vince back then, but Vin- Mac- Vince is like, yeah, you couldn't do it then, like... Yeah, because right. he threat. He, yeah, because uh, Max says, "Next time I see you, I'm gonna kill you." And Vince snarls, "Are you sure?" Yeah, because you couldn't get it done the last time. 
Yeah, so there's clearly some crazy history there. We kind of come to the big scene where Audrey comes to talk to Nathan about the Max situation, correct? Right. She tells him her theory that about them both having the same affliction. So, uh, you know, that they must be related. So immediately Nathan uh, storms off pissed, you know, into the chief's office and the chief comes clean. He's like, well, you, you figured he had the same affliction as you and that you're related. Uh, you're right. He, he's, he's your father. And uh, you know, and he apologizes that he d- didn't tell him sooner, but Nathan's like, ah, yeah, uh, he's pissed. He's like, but yeah, you always keep secrets. And so Nathan storms out and chief tries to explain himself to Audrey that, you know, he always wanted to tell him, but was waiting for it to get better. And now he's lost them. Yeah. And that Max was super shitty to Nathan and the mom. So that's why. Yeah. Uh, he has but, no regrets, but based on that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we kind of cut to Max walking through town, probably going to go threaten somebody else or, you know, shake someone ste- else down, steal a kid's balloon or something. When, uh, the fissures start happening through the city and a giant crack starts opening the street. Max tries to escape it, but he can't. The crack opens up and he falls to his death in the ground. Audrey and Nathan are on the scene of the fissure. The The chief is in his truck there and the chief just freaks out and speeds off without even talking to him. Julia Carr confirms that Max is dead and says, that, hey, Duke will be happy about that, which uh, which gets Nathan thinking, Damn it, Duke must be involved in this. And you gotta remember, Nathan's super pissed right now. Right. He's off the he's off the hook, off the off the I don't know, off 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 everything. He's off the hook, off the chain, off everything. Uh so they go to confront Duke and he's like, Duke, did you kill him? Duke is like, I didn't kill him, but I'm fucking pleased as hell that somebody did. Uh and he's just over the moon. Nathan's pissed off until Audrey reminds Duke, hey. There's other guys with tattoos like that. You're probably still not safe. And Duke's like, oh, fuck. What a buzzkill. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the chief goes to visit Vince and Dave. Uh, and he's looking like just hammered shit. He's lighting cigarettes with the last cigarette. His hair is all tussled. He's looking bad. Yeah. And he, and he basically tells them that, uh, you know, Nathan found out today that uh, Max is his father. They, they try to console him, but it really doesn't do much for uh, poor chief. Yeah. Uh, Julia and Duke kind of talk a bit and Julia shows him a photo of her grandfather who also had the tattoo and says that she has something to show him. Right. Yeah. And his washboard abs in the 1940s or whatever it was. Um, Meanwhile, Nathan goes to the gray goal to kind of investigate, I guess, to try to to find the chief. Yeah, he wants to find uh, he wants to talk to the the waitress about Max and then realizes that, hey, when Max was there, chief was there obviously upsetting him at the same time the lighthouse cracked and went down damn it chief's behind it chief's always been behind it right and dave kind of tries to calm nathan down but nathan's out of control vince is like yeah just let him do his thing meanwhile the thing julia wanted to show duke is at the cemetery she shows him uh before they even get to the headstone of her grandfather they see the symbol on a headstone and then they look around at all the rest and all of them have Either the symbol that we've been seeing or kind of like this variation of it, like one that looks more like, I don't know, a more less jagged lines, more like smooth lines version, but uh, all generally the same symbol. Bum, bum. Uh, and then we come to Nathan's really mad at his dad uh, and pissed, but Audrey kind of tells him, like, hey, we're going to confront it. Where would he go? And at that point, they figure out that he, at the beach that he's sitting at. Right. And the chiefs, and this is kind of, you know, really the key scene of, of the episode and uh, the chief's there and he's like, Hey, I knew you'd figure it out. You're good cops. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he's been, it's not an easy holding everything together. He's tried drinking, smoking, even church, but none of it helps. You know, you know, he did kill Max, even though it was an accident, but he doesn't regret, regret it because Max was pure evil. And uh, he says, really, the only way out of this is for me to die. Otherwise, he's going to destroy everything, you know, and Nathan wants Audrey to tell him it's going to be OK. And he, the chief is like, you know, it's not going to be OK. Chief gets upset, turns into stone and then explodes. And uh, Nathan is just rocked by it. Yeah, the Teagues show up. Um, they've gathered all the chief's rocks that he was made out of and put them in an ice box. You know, Audrey goes to kind of try to soothe Nathan while the Teagues clean up the mess of the chief on the beach. And Nathan's just pissed. He's just, you know, uncontrollably angry and is like, you know, you've helped all these other troubled people, but you couldn't help my dad. You couldn't even tell him it was going to be all right. Like, get the hell out of here. I'm out of here. He leaves. He's furious. 
we we move to uh, the Cape Rouge and Duke and uh, Julia are down down in the you know in the boat and Duke's pouring them both a glass of wine even though Julia's not really wanting to be there. She gave him the as much information as she wants to be involved because she still doesn't like him. And interestingly, as uh, as she's facing him, she's wearing a tank top and on her uh, left shoulder blade, the maze image tattoo appears and then dis- disappears. But then she leaves and then Duke's pissed. So Duke goes into the next room where he has a conspiracy board and he writes down Julia's name on his conspiracy board where he's got pictures of Max Hansen, the Colorado kid and so forth. Right. Uh, Nathan, you know, picks up his dad's badge, you know, uh, kind of like, I guess, like a little symbol of, you know, carrying on. And as he goes to the chief's office, he finds the rev sitting there and the revs basically like a. Hey, uh, we're gonna. Cl- I'm gonna clean up this fucking town now that your dad's out of the way. You better get the fuck out of here. Or you're gonna get. Uh, you're gonna get taken out too because you're damned. You're fucked up. I'm giving you a chance to leave now. And Nathan's like, no, nah, like I gotta stop you. Yeah, he he says if you stay, you will suffer. So Nathan's kind of a bit more calmed now. He goes to talk to Audrey, and uh, they kind of go to talk. You know, they're you at uh, is is it where the Colorado kid photo? Yes, it's yeah. back at the site of the Colorado kid, and Audrey is, you know, you know, they make up. They make up. Nathan explains, "Hey, I was upset. I under, I understand." She tells him her secret that, "Hey, turns out I'm Lucy." And, and you know, she's and like, before, "Don't say anything," and he's kind of like, "Okay, you know, like." But the before they ever. have a ch- chance to go any further, a uh, nice young lady in a professional uh, pantsuit approaches and starts asking for Audrey Parker. And when uh, Audrey says, hey, this must be about Max Hansen, all of a sudden, they all draw their guns on each other. And uh, she uh, goes to into reaching her jacket, I believe, for some ID. And they go, hey, hey. And she's like, what am I going to do? Pull a second gun out? And then uh, she shows her id i'm agent audrey parker boom gasp all right so that's uh that's everything that went on at spiral it's a lot summary is a little longer than we usually do but it's a big episode a lot of stuff to talk about what would you give this episode on our kind of the rankings we we usually do yeah and uh there was a lot to talk about because this is like the seminal moment of, of the season where everything com- com- comes together. So that, that's why it's a little longer. And uh, mm-hmm. I really love this episode and it's my favorite of the season. Uh, is it really? Did, it is. It is. It, the, the episode didn't have nearly as much humor as we are accustomed to, but that didn't matter because we wrapped up most of the hanging threads and really set the table for what was going to occur in season two. This was definitely a season finale. I think the writing team did a great job of closing things out. I would give Spiral a 9.5, but we've uh, eschewed half numbers on differential meters. <laughs> you, can so use, you can use half numbers. I've hey, hey, never hey. outlawed it. Hey, you know, this is a, it's a joint thing. So I'm going to honor the, the, your version <laughs> of the differential meter, and I'm going to give it a 9. I can't quite okay. justify giving it a 10, but it's very close for me. And it's a lot of it is just because the way it ties everything up. I really, really like that. I thought the acting was good. Some might think Nathan's uh, anger was a little overblown, but I'll be honest with you, I've had somewhat kind of similar situation in my life, and I can't tell you how much anger it caused me in, in my life, you know, when I was, especially when I was younger. So I, I actually get it. I really liked it, loved it. It's a little, I'm having a hard time figuring out my number because. So in the commentary, they said it was a lot like an opera where it was kind of there was just a lot of stuff happening and the characters weren't really aware of what's going on. And I felt like the episode, it was a lot of significant things happening, but it was a lot of. It was kind of it just felt scattered and it was in a way that I didn't dislike. I liked it. I liked it, but it's a little different than how Haven normally is. Haven's normally really neat and like really uh, composed. And here it's very uncomposed very chaotic uh half the scenes are just max going around town and meeting our main characters basically everybody gets a scene with max is essentially kind of what half the episode boils down to right well max is the agent of chaos which causes the chaos right it just like it's kind of formulaic when you're like you're like okay then max went talked to nathan then max went talked to duke then max went to talk to vince uh and i really liked it i really like all those scenes kind of individually i almost feel like 
it's an episode that the parts are better than the whole. Like, I don't particularly dislike any scene, but I think added up, it's hard to see the through thread of like, what was Max even really doing? You know, what was Max doing? Well, and that's, uh, that, that's one of the things that I observed was, uh, okay, so Dave apparently owes Max. Okay, why? You know, and we didn't get to figure that out. Okay, uh, he tried to kill Vince in the past for some reason. <laughs> Why? We didn't get to figure it out. Who was the family he murdered? Was that legit or was he covered up? Because he seems like he's proud of killing the Colorado kid. So those are interesting things that I wanted to know. So maybe, you know, I, I guess they could like kind of write it off saying, hey, but he died before we had a chance to say any of that. But it sure would have been information I would have loved to know. And just kind of the movement of the characters is really messy, in my opinion. Like, Audrey's at the police station, then Audrey's at home, then Audrey's at the Grey Gull, then Audrey's here, then she's back at the Grey Gull. It's just kind of like, or not back at the Grey Gull, but she's still at the Grey Gull. Then, like, she's here, then she's there. It's, It just feels like characters are unnecessarily moving around a lot. Um, it just feels, like, super chaotic. And, like, I think that's kind of a good, I think that's a good effect. It kind of throws off the balance of <clears throat> what you've been expecting from the show. You're kind of expecting a more controlled, the way it usually is. And here it's, uh, Max has thrown the entire events of the show into just complete uh, disarray where everybody's moving around where you can't really tell where anyone is at any time, right? But it it makes the conflict a little confusing because I didn't feel... I understand that cracks are a big deal, but I feel like it wasn't as strongly built up as I felt like it should have been. Because really, besides Duke's boat, it's really never like talked about and it's not talked about as like a big a threat as it is really like i don't know and i think it's also because we're not getting reactions of the town i think that's maybe the biggest issue to me is like we need some kind of scene where chief's sitting at the gray gull eating and a citizen of the town's like so what's going on like the whole fucking town is cracking and falling apart like we only really get interactions from the main cast uh and that waitress who duke is horrible too <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, I think that's my issue, like in Jaws, right? In Jaws, it's not just the main characters talking about the shark. It's You get that scene of the whole town talking about, you know, like, oh, you can't shut down the beach. And some, you know, and some people are like, oh, you know, we got to. And like other people, you know, like we have this like situation where we're getting um, reactions uh, to kind of something a writing teacher taught me is that one of our best tools to, uh, informing the citizens i'm sorry not the citizens the viewers of what they should you know of how to you know of how to assess what's going on whether it's how a character is viewed or situation is viewed is through reaction of others right so we need we need multiple reactions from multiple takes you know we're like nathan and audrey are like oh, i'm trying to figure out this crack situation but we need some people to give us other looks at the situation to give us uh, a more well-rounded idea of the threat. And I felt like the cracks just wasn't, you know, or like the people like <clears throat> in the street when Max falls in, you know, everybody's just kind of like, oh, you know, holy shit, this is crazy. Okay, you know. It's Haven. Crack you know, kills. Last week, <laughs> last week, there was a giant metal ball rolling, you know, so it seems pretty, you know, av like an average day here. Whereas people I are think getting cocooned by their blankets. Or the rev, right? We needed the rev to be there in the street being like, I fucking told you this is chaos. This is what you guys do. We needed, I think, either some random citizens or the presence of the rev backed up by the idea that he does represent the people of Haven that don't want anything to do with the troubles. Because right now, it just kind of seems like the rev's a crazy asshole who hates these people for no reason. But I'm sure there's a large contingent of the town, and I think that'll play a part in season two, that want nothing to do with the troubled people. Uh, and I think we needed a bit more of that, but also we have 42 minutes and we're struggling to fit everything we can in as is. No, it, it, exactly. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, what, what do you think about the way Max died? Like in terms of execution of like shooting it or like in terms of like on paper, how it was written, uh, it just, you like know, the idea of how he dies, like, like, like the idea, Oh, he just fell in a hole. I can confirm he's dead. Well, what, how'd he die? Did he land on a, a sharp rock and it pierced him and he died? Blunt trauma to the head. He, he just fell in a hole and died. And 
I, I mean, mean, yeah, who it's fucking deep. Like you fall in a hole, you die. Like <laughs> and you not can't necessarily. Be- what if you hit the sides and yeah, you know, I don't know. I just I, I thought they could have been a little more uh, you know, complete with, you know, oh yeah, maybe he hit his head on a rock at the bottom and that was it. I mean, I think it would have even been fine if they were like, Yeah, we never found a body. Like he just dis- he just like was you know, he fell forever, Gandalf style. So he's gonna be he's gonna come back as the white. Yeah, Max the Ma- white supremacist. Max the white. Um, Max the white sup- oh my god, good lord. <laughs> he was in prison. What do you think? What do you think his well, other tattoos yeah. were? Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm sure there's a swastika on his back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that fa- that comes and goes uh, at will. Uh, thematically, though, I like that the chief's wrath uh, is what kills him. I'm yeah, fine. I, with I that. do do like that. I do. I I do like that. That's I like that concept. I j- just you know I guess kind of the the follow through for me but it wasn't a big deal it didn't really detract much from the episode i was like, have to be some with... reasons it's got to be some reasons why it's not a 10 and that <laughs> might be one of them uh i think it's a bit chaotic i think we're going to get into our thoughts on the whole season overall at the end that's kind of our special segment at the end is we're going to talk about a season review so i'll get into kind of more of my thoughts on this then so for now i'll give it a i'll give it an eight out of ten because i really like the chief Every scene he's in is pretty awesome, even if like not much is really happening. Like the Dave and Vince scene is pretty superfluous. It doesn't really need to be in there, but he's so good uh, and compelling in every moment that uh, makes the episode just to get that the chief coming undone. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That was one of my key observation was uh, I really like Nick Campbell's performance in this episode. I thought he was excellent. Yeah, I, I thought he was top notch. And the, uh, you know, they, they were, you know, all the other actors and the, uh, you know, producer and writers, they were very impressed with Nick Campbell. I mean, and they, they always are because, you know, he's, he's he is an excellent actor and apparently he's very well known and you know, circles that we're not familiar with. But also speaking of that, in that same vein, I really enjoyed the prefer- performance from uh, John Bourgeois, who played uh, Max Hansen. Sorry if I butchered that name. I thought he was a good Max Hansen. Oh, sorry. You're good. Um, I, thought, I thought Max was good. I know in the special features, they were trying to draw a parallel to Randall Flagg. I don't know if he... There's like another Mother Abigail situation where it's a super shitty, like super shitty comparison. But in the commentary, they don't really comment. They don't really like follow through on that. But in the special features of that pop up, the pop up video type thing, yeah, they're saying yeah. like he's like Randall Flag, uh, not quite. But I I see that he's what you said perfectly was agent of chaos. Um, I thought he was really good. I thought also he was really compelling. I also I also really like Duke in this episode. There's some episodes where I feel like Duke is kind of forced in there. Uh, right? Sometimes I feel like he's not necessary to certain episodes, but this one was an episode where I wanted, where I was like, yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the chief, but I also want to know more about what's going on with Duke. Uh, like his scene with Max on the boat was cool. Uh, then, you know, celebrating Max's death was a good scene. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> and then Audrey being the buzzkill and getting him uh, getting him uh, scared again. So, yeah, which, you know, and then his whole little uh, his uh, tattoo fucking conspiracy adventure. board. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about the, the, the tattoo, what do you think about Julia's magical tattoo? I I like vaguely remember some things about it later on that I'm not going to like, but I, I can't remember in full detail. So, like, I'm guessing we'll get more answers later. It just feels weird because it's like. Julia feels like a truly neutral party. And in this episode, it's like, oh, yeah, well, my grandpa has this tattoo. And, you know, and then to the audience, like, so, you know, so does she is kind of weird. You know, like, it's just kind of, I don't know. That's like if you were in a debate and you find out and then like in the middle of the debate, the like mediator, like ripped off his shirt and revealed that he was actually like working for, you know, like somebody, you know, was like, ha like I'm secretly, you know, working for the Green Party or something. You're like, what? Like, what's going on? You were just like kind of a neutral person. Like, I don't understand where this, I, I just don't understand it. it like it, it seems to come out of nowhere as of now but i'm but i think we learn more kind of i mean we are gonna get into more about this later with julia and the tattoo or do you mean the effects of the tattoo well the and i effects. was 
it's no, not not really not related to special effects, but I was like, dude, everyone else's tattoo is right there on that uh, left forearm, at least with men. I don't maybe I was it's like, oh, they were men. all men. That's what I was going to say. Maybe it's different, but I just how 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 why does it appear and disappear? Now the wiki uh, said it's when she gets angry. Um, okay, because uh, I'm just curious. You know, I'm not. I don't think Julia Carr's in season two. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that she's not. But I think we get an explanation on why the tattoo appears and disappears from what I remember. I don't I don't remember that one. So I look forward to watching it. I wish uh, I had a a trouble where it made my mortgage bill disappear. But (laughs) but it always comes back. It always comes back due on the first. Yeah. So one of the other key observations I have is, uh, man, Nathan is really put through the ringer again. (laughs) You know, I mean, he has his usual daddy issues. Then finds out he has a different dad who dies before he really gets to know much about him. And then his other dad fucking turns to rock and explodes. And uh, (laughs) then he goes back to his office and finds the Rev sitting in the chief's chair talking about how he's got to get out of Dodge because, you know, sufferings are coming. I mean, hey, I hope they set Nathan up with some fun stuff and possibly possibly a lady in season two. I don't think maybe the Rev adopts him. So he gets a third dad. Yeah, that's uh, he did say your daddy was a was a good man. So uh, and he was talking about Chief, not uh, Max. Was he? Yeah, he was. How do you know? I think he I think he mentions both of them in in that. I was like, because he mentions Max like right after. So then for a second, I was like, wait, is he talking about the chief or Max? His chief was a chief was a good man. He knows that. So how how does he know? He he, he, maybe he knew about the trouble. I thought it was clear to me. Uh, It was clear to me. But, uh, you know, I could have been reading into it. And that, but no, no I, I, I thought the Rev thought the chief was a good man, but then said Nathan, basically Nathan shouldn't talk shit about his other daddy because, you know, <laughs> Max is still his daddy. And uh, I good just re- thought Lucas Bryant was excellent in, in, in this episode myself. I thought, I thought he did a great job. It was a good thing. We had kind of built up his explosive temper before. Luckily we know he's uh, extra violent from the, sh- you know, the, <laughs> Or like he can get a little crazy now uh i feel like earlier episodes hadn't built it up but this episode had the backing of like the shadow man episode where he was uh yeah, the dark yeah. man where he was willing to kill still calling him still calling him the shadow man where the dark man he was willing to kill him was that the carpenter who moved to haven from alabama in the 50s the dark yeah <laughs> according to dave and vince it was a different time it was a different time did you take Audrey for a talking to God type? Hey, man, when uh, you you discover that you were probably looked exactly the same and were there 25 years ago, I think I'm talking to anybody who's got an answer of any kind for me. I think I'm giving uh, God a thumbs up if I still look the same 25 years later. I'm like, hey, good you job. Know, I, I, might be call, <laughs> I might be calling Duke and, uh, hey, uh, uh, regarding this, what does the Buddha say? <laughs> you know, and I think it's cool. That Audrey basically has accepted she's Lucy, you know, and, uh, you know, she's like, she doesn't know the specifics of it, but I mean, she kind of accepts it. At least that's how it appears to me. And even the chief in his little last spiel, he was like, I was, I've been holding it together because I was waiting for you to return, Audrey. Maybe you could have told us about this stuff a little damn sooner than at, at right before you die, you know, and give us a little more detail <laughs> kind of. Uh, and, and that's kind of like my leads into my next question for you. What do you think about the Teagues not answering Audrey's question about some people not being thrilled she's back? I mean, it's pretty typical for what they've pulled, right? Nobody in this fucking town answers anything from this older generation. We had just like you just said, the chief, he didn't say shit. till it's like. Oh, hey, I have 30 seconds. He's basically a basketball team that's fucked around for four, you know, three quarters and 10 minutes in the last two minutes. It's like, oh, shit, maybe I should try to tell them about this a little bit, but still not really say anything. Eleanor Carr didn't say shit, you know, about what she knew. They didn't even find out about the fire starter until she was dead and they looked through her notes. That's when they found uh, stuff that was useful. So I'm not really surprised it's it's infinitely frustrating where it's like oh for fuck's sake can you throw us a bone and just tell us one thing but it's not surprising that they never that they just uh well clearly vince wants to but dave is like no 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 uh because it sounds like vince wants to get more in the game and dave is like we're gonna stay alive by staying on the sideline buddy like let's not get involved well and this episode and i agree with you because i just it just 
you know, I, I get it because Audrey's got to, you know, and, and Nathan, they all got to learn this shit so that we get 13 episodes. And Do you think it's that or do you think the writers just don't know? They say they know, but do you believe them? They, I do believe them. They, they, they say they know how everything ends for the entire series so? overall. You know, and uh, and they have enough mythology for even more than uh, the the season set uh, the show ended up actually having. So I, we'll we'll talk about that in the season, uh, our overall season discussion. Discussion, but yeah, I, but it's frustrating. I really would you know li- like them to uh, give just some, give us something, give us something. I, I mean, because. And I like Vincent. Uh, I, I love seeing badass Vince. That was yeah. one of my favorite parts of this episode. And uh, you what know. a transformation from like old nice doofus to like fucking hardcore badass. Like, yeah, like uh, yeah, you're you're gonna make me do something I enjoy, really enjoy doing. I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, and that's why I'm kind of like Vince. Now that we see that side, wouldn't Vince be like, all right, fuck you, Dave. Stop being a pussy. And we're going to fucking tell Audrey some what, what, what she needs to know. But Dave's probably a soft spot because it's his brother, you know? Like, it's probably the one person he can't really ever get like that with. Although, I think he, I don't know. I guess, I think he's got a tolerance to Dave, right? Where he's he's accepting of Dave's neutrality for now. But we'll see if it holds over time. Because I feel like Vince is just... You know, he's ready to get in the game. Coach put him in, but Dave wants to hang back. Dave's like, look, dude, we got a good thing with this prostitute ring at, tar- at the Target. <laughs> I don't want to – let's not fuck around with these people. Yeah, let's get Helena, dude, and that's you know, and that's it. Dude, we're sitting ducks riding a tandem bike. You know, all, <laughs> you know, we get shot easily riding our tandem bike. So, okay, I, I guess I guess I'll uh, you know, I can I can accept that. It's just like I said, it's it, it's frustrating. Oh yeah, and uh, we, you know, and like I'd mentioned earlier, how I thought they came full circle and closed some threads. Uh, I thought they did a great job of that with with this episode, like. Uh, like Chief mentioning once again, how many times he mentioned to Nathan, he doesn't see what's right in front of him, but Audrey does. Julia helping Duke, but reaffirming she still doesn't like him. And then, of course, the 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 second gun gag, you know, and, yeah. and the tandem bike itself is another full circle. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so that that was pretty cool. And then probably the last thing, you know, that I really observed was, and this is more for you and I, is that Emily Rose really liked the opening song when she was at the Colorado Kids site. Yeah. And uh, and I was glass elevator, correct? Or in a glass elevator or something like that? Yeah, I won't talk too much about it because we really want you to become a Patreon member because there <laughs> is a Haven soundtrack episode where we go on. I, in particular, go on quite a bit about that song because I, I find it favorable. So that's for our Patreon members. But just a sneak peek. We discuss that in depth. Yeah, um, the Audrey Parker twist is great at the end. I remember the first time we I watched this that that was like a mind-blowing twist that I was not cliffhanger that I was not uh prepared for I still remembered it from the first time I watched it so I was like yeah here she comes any minute now but I remember the first time I was like what the fuck like another oh shit like this is an Audrey although it makes a lot of sense considering we just found out she's actually Lucy uh it makes sense that the Audrey personality is or the Audrey identity is fake I guess uh well, which confirms that considering there's a fucking real Audrey Parker, depending on how everything goes, though. Is she real? How do we know? Yes, if Audrey Parker's not Audrey Parker, she could be a shapeshifter. <laughs> yeah, that's a guy Oop. from Carpenter's Not. Yeah, you know, old Vaughn, old Vaughn Carpenter. Yeah, he's... yeah. So, yeah, that's could that was really cool. I enjoyed that as well. Uh, so were you surprised that Stephen McCaddy, who plays the Rev, read for the role of Chief first? I thought we heard that in another special feature, a commentary. So I thought I already, we already knew that. Uh, but I wasn't surprised that, that you know, then once, once they saw his audition. And that's kind of the case, I think, for a lot of, like, other roles is, like, they auditioned for, like, the main role, right? Like, right. Uh, and Batman Begins, right? Uh, I don't know if it's Cillian or Killian. So Mr. Murphy uh, auditioned for Batman originally, and they were like, oh, shit, we really like this guy, but he's not Batman. He's Scarecrow. Uh, so they were like, yeah, can we give you a Scarecrow? And he's like, yeah, that's cool. Um, 
So uh, no a- job or scarecrow. I'm going with scarecrow. <laughs> yeah, he's a very like you know, he's he's never. I would accept with the, maybe the exception of Tron Evolution. I don't know if he's ever gone for like super big budget movies. You know that aren't re- personally rewarding because he has a very very small role in Tron Evolution that I think was supposed to. If they made a third movie, it was supposed to lead into him being the main villain of the third one, but they never made a third one. There are some things that are good. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, was like, I, didn't I, see I, I enjoyed I didn't see evolution. Him. I didn't see him. But uh, so did you, did you think that uh, uh, Stephen McCaddy has crazy eyes like Christopher Walken? Yes, he has crazy eyes. He just has a meaner looking face than Walken. Walken, Walken you don't know if he's going to like, you don't know if he's going to like, you know, be super cool or maybe say something kind of scary you're like what mccaddy it's guaranteed it's going to be scary like what he's going to say yeah with walking you know he's either going to murder you or start dancing or give you a medal that your dad kept in his ass for or did he kept he kept in his ass right or the dad kept in his ass yeah okay yeah yeah but he obviously had a transfer to his ass when the dad died i was like there was a lot it was just some transfer for metal from you know Ask to ass uh, transfer. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I don't think, yeah, I think I'm glad the way it turned out. I, I wouldn't want, I like McCaddy as the Rev because he's got a real, you know, fire and brimstone personality or look for the role. And after this, after, you know, there's the chief is kind of, I feel like wasted talent for half the season or two thirds of the season, but the episode like Carpenter's not, he's awesome in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, the, the the ship, the trial of Audrey Parker, he's also really good in. So like those three episodes, yeah. I think he's awesome. And I think his other You didn't time, like him in fur? You didn't like him in fur? He's just kind of like a fucking like he's just like he's just kind of there like, hey, you got 24 hours to catch the wolf and after or I'm hunting go, it down. Yeah, and then like after they shoot the moose, he's like, All right, peace out, I'm out of here. You guys just fucking have the report on my desk. I don't care. Like he just stopped showing up. He stopped giving. He went to fucking go get food at the. Great he went Gulf. to the goal for the you know to, to get get the brunch special. Learn his but, pirate uh, pirate lore. Nah, I, and I agree with you with McCaddy. I uh, I really couldn't see really anyone else playing the the role like him. You know, with, with one exception, obviously Jack like, Nicholson. Jack Nicholson, right? Um. <laughs> I wasn't gonna let that one go. And uh, a couple quick notes from the commentary. Uh, Sean Piller, his nephew, and the hairstylist Jojo made a cameo in it. Uh, Eric was uh, Balfour was not participating in the commentary because he was out promoting Skyline. Well, Sean Piller is like, it's awesome. Like, Sean, yeah. Skyline's so good. I was like, is it Sean? Is it Sean? Is it? <laughs> we know you guys are close and you kind of have to say that. And, uh, and I love what- Donald Fison, but... Uh, Hey, if Eric wants to come on the show, then I will fully endorse Skyline and <laughs> ask everyone to watch it and buy a Blu-ray copy. I, I like the ending to Skyline, actually, like the final 30 seconds, but the rest of it's not very good. I think there was a sequel, too, with uh, Grillo, Frank Grillo. I'm fairly certain stars in the sequel. I don't think I'll be watching Beyond Skyline unless there's just a demand for us to do a Patreon episode about Skyline and the Skyline trilogy, I should say. Okay, a couple of just really quick, quick more things that were kind of neat from the from the commentary. So when the chief turned a rock and explodes, they actually exploded a bag of ice so that it could be eco friendly and it would just melt and they wouldn't have to clean it up. I, I thought that was that really was good. not for eco friendly. <laughs> that was because of that was because of work. They didn't want to pick all the pieces up, which I understand. Um, but yeah, you can't one. give them any any green green cred <laughs> at all. You can't give them any green cred for no, it. no, no. It was it was nice, but definitely they did it because so they didn't have to clean anything up. They, they did mention that, but they also said it was good for the environment. So <laughs> yeah. I was, right. just like Apple not including chargers moving forward in the iPhone is good for the yeah. environment. Well, and, and another fun thing, uh, interesting thing was the cemetery scene with Duke and Julia was originally the end for episode ten. They had mentioned so. I kind of like them putting it in here. I thought that was kind of cool because that's really setting up what season two is going to be. I yeah. 
And then the last thing from the, the commentary is uh, Emily mentions that the writers had originally had Nathan and um, Audrey kissing at, at that last scene, but she thought they've already done that. And she thought them like uh, handing the badge and touching hands was more intimate, kind of like you'd mentioned in an earlier episode. So I you could my... say it. I'm right. I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm, <laughs> I was wrong back then. I'm just saying, giving you credit for your idea of more intimacy so yeah i'm telling you like not not being able to touch just the idea of like hands touching and feeling that is like powerful enough for somebody who can't feel i think like you know and then it's like a build-up you know and then the kiss is big uh because the idea of romance is more exciting than watching romance you know what i'm saying like instead of what do you find more inter what do you or what are you more drawn to is like people falling in love on tv or people being in love in tv oh well, obviously it, shows get boring after people like uh you know get together well yeah you look at the office and uh you you, you kind of uh yeah good example will, will, when will pam and uh jim P- pam and jim get together how long time will she will he really marry roy you know will he leave uh his girlfriend from uh stratton so how did you feel about the chief blowing up did you like the way his death kind of was like displayed so he's yeah, having I... uncontrollable earthquakes and he's shaking quaking everything's cracking up around him and he turns to stone and then explodes like a bomb did you think that was like did you like that i did i i did like that i mean some of the effects you know maybe weren't weren't the best but i understand you know 2010 on what their budget <laughs> But I, I thought it tied into, you know, the trouble itself with, you know, hey, things are cracking. You know, my, my kind of thinking, though, is uh, he says he's been holding it together for so long. But wouldn't that only be during the times of the troubles? So hasn't he had a break from like 85 till recently? Yeah. So this is kind of one of the issues I have with this season. Um, I was mentioning it briefly and we can touch upon it later is inconsistency with the information we have is like there's a lot of uncertain information where I'm not sure where we stand on everything. And that's one of them is like, yeah, so has Chief been holding in these earthquakes for since 83? We don't have all the information. And I didn't really love the Chief exploding. I thought that was a bit dramatic. Or I should say it was, it was a bit bombastic is a better phrase. I thought him kind of like turning to stone was cool, but then he should have kind of shattered apart rather than combusting is like what I would have rather like happened is I would have rather he kind of split and broke apart like into pieces. I thought the explosion felt a bit like action movie, you know, where they have to, Oh, and dive back, you know, and there's pieces flying everywhere. Uh, and what's trying realistic. To get, trying to get you excited to go see skyline. I thought it would have been better to see, you know, and maybe they couldn't do this because of special effects. I would have, I would have rather the kind of drama of getting to close in on the chief's face And watching him kind of crumble to pieces like that uh, would have been, I think, more emotional for us and Nathan than the explosion. But I understand maybe budgetary, it would have looked just worse like that. Yeah, no, I see. I see what you're saying there. I mean, I think what you described probably would have been better, but I still I still liked it. And I was I I was fine with it. But the thing that was cool about it was uh, and we we didn't mention this earlier, is that, you know, they gather up all of his uh, (laughs) his pieces in in the, you know, in in the, you know, the old beer cooler. But then uh, we get a glimpse of the pieces shifting and moving a little bit. So or my favorite part is that they are plaid, like they look like a shirt. It was pretty cool. So uh, does does that portend to maybe uh, another visit from the chief in a future season? I don't know. You'll have to watch to see. Or you have to listen to us talk about it. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't know, watch the show. Just listen to Don't watch to us. the show. I mean, <laughs> listen to us, you know. So another thing in the commentary was that, interestingly, they – you know, didn't know if they were going to have a season two, but they didn't come up with alternate endings to shoot. So if this show got canceled after season one, there would have been no fucking answer or resolution at all to this show. We would have been fucked if this is like how it if, if this is how it ended, because they had no plans to give us any kind of like, you know, because it's not always great. But in certain shows, you know, they have like an alternate where it's like, oh, shit, we got canceled. Just throw this in. It's a shitty ending, but it's an ending. This one, they would have been like, just left us hanging if we didn't get a season two. Well, and I think 
I think uh, Sam Ernst said that you know if you do, if you write it, you end up having to use it <laughs> or something like that, didn't he say? Or but it would have sucked if, if the show ended and that and that was it. You know, kind of like the way the miracles ended. I understand what he's saying is to like don't give yourself an op a second op, like an out because you're gonna end up taking it. But I don't really think that applies in this situation because there legitimately could have been a situation where that was really needed. I would prefer to, you know, the way I kind of look at it is uh, if people commit to watch an entire season and you get canceled, I would like to see you give them some closure, you know, yeah. as, uh, you know, throwing a bone to the, to the fans who watched the show and supported it. But that's what I think. Who knows? I'm just a podcaster. And something I really liked to the commentary or like kind of an observation about the commentaries overall. We've talked about it a bit that the bigger ones are more chaotic. It's hard to get a grasp of what's going on when there's like so many voices. But one thing I really like that I've like realized is that I would take a commentary of just Emily Rose talking and maybe like with like, I guess maybe a podcast. Oh God. I was about to suggest you make a Haven rewatch podcast. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, yay, blasphemy. Don't sabotage us. Uh, <laughs> edit that out. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I would love to hear her talk about just the acting process, actually, because she has really insightful information and she's usually breaking down stuff uh, in terms of like what she's trying to do and the emotions of the scene and talking about, you know, oh, you know, her and Eric Balfour were talking about the scene where she tells, you know, where she tells Duke she can't tell him before Nathan um, and kind of how they were discussing that, you know, before shooting it. Whereas, and the other ones are the other people talking are fine. Lucas Bryant's usually all about humor. Uh, yeah, when Audrey's like, "Yeah, you went to a really dark place," and he's like, "Did I?" And I was like, "Yeah, man, look at the fucking screen." Yeah, you were, and he's like, "Oh, I guess." <laughs> yeah, hey, he wasn't as funny as he usually is. On you know the, the couple no. that he's been on, he's he's usually even funnier than this. So I would recommend he just, that. He seemed more like reined in versus like it wasn't that he wasn't trying to be funny. He seemed just more passive on this one um well and and one thing with emily rose is uh you know we learn in the special features that you know she wanted to teach acting right? right and she really is like you said she's good at breaking down what she's doing what they're doing what the discussions are and it really shows that it is a collective effort because the actors bring ideas i mean uh oh, eric yeah. balfour has contributed a lot of stuff to the show things that were his idea. the gun that was the, the gun underneath like uh whatever the the, the bench. table yeah or bench. that was that was eric balfour's idea so yeah and sam ernst didn't want to do it but jim dunn basically allowed it to happen uh which i think was a good idea i'm glad jim dunn went with that decision because it shows kind of how much of uh planning you know duke is very charming and seems harmless like oh you know i'm just like a guy but you know we're seeing more and more that he's actually pretty fucking violent and prepared to fuck people up dude he's han solo to max's greedo but in this one, it's the equivalent to Obi-Wan opening a hole in the fucking earth and letting Greedo fall in. Um, but yeah, I just liked her. I like her commentary breaking, you know, because normally I really like the kind of writers and directors. Like, I really like the Charles R. Die one. That was a really good comment. That was really good. Uh, like, his was really good. I, I usually, as a writer, I gravitate more towards, like, the writers. But Audrey's analysis on the acting is just really... It's like when you're uh, to bring it back to sports, like we occasionally do when you're watching like sports and you find somebody who can break down the game in a really like, you know, I'm an NBA fan. So like one person I know on ESPN that does a good job, like Tim Legler, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Legler's um, very good. I like Legler when he breaks down, you know, the game and stuff in uh or, you know, to talk about kind of the goat announcer or commentator right now is like Tony Romo for football. Uh, he's able to quickly break down what's going to happen why it happened in a fun and entertaining way. And I think uh, Emily Rose, I'm not, I'm not saying she's a Tony Romo of uh, director commentaries, but she's very good at like talking about what's important emotionally and what they're doing and motivation in the scenes and stuff that uh, you're not hearing from these other guys just because they're not necessarily directors, they're writers and Sean Pillar's an executive producer. And that's a completely different skill set than the episode directors have and the actors have. So it's nice getting that kind of, one of the things with the commentaries when you have like mo more than like one or two people is there's something they want to explain, but then 
a, a few of them have to get their two cents in and you end up missing other things that you might have yeah. wanted some commentary on. So that's the thing that was really nice about Charles R. Die just doing his is that we really got commentary on pretty much everything throughout the episode. Like on this one, there was times where they talked, they went like two scenes, but you know, talking mm. about something from two scenes ago and we missed kind of two scenes and every now and then they kind of rounded back to try to just quickly mention it, but they didn't catch everything. So that's one of the things with it. I still, I still enjoyed it though. Yeah. Yeah. This one was good. I thought that trial of Audrey Parker one was really chaotic, but this one was more contained, I think, than that one. Uh, which once again, we mentioned Eric Balfour couldn't be a part of because he was doing Skyline. Um, but yeah, there was definitely an occasion where Jim Dunn was trying to say, he was trying to, they were talking about a scene I think he wrote or something. He was trying to get one last word in, but people kept saying something. So he's like, uh, 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 and then eventually he's just like, oh, fuck it. You know, fuck it. Like, fuck it. Yeah. Fuck it. Get that on the director's cut uh, special feature. I did have a, I did catch something interesting was they were talking about that song in the opening that uh, you're saying Emily Rose liked. But Sam Ernst was like, oh, is this Sweet Talk Radio or this is Sweet Talk Radio, right? And they're like, no, no, no. Uh, this one's a real song. And so I wasn't really sure what that meant. I found that he didn't be... call him Sweet Talk Radio. He he botched yeah. the name. And I'm it like, like, it was like old talk radio or sweet old radio or something like that. That's what he called him. Shit talk radio. No, it wasn't shit talk <laughs> radio. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, well, what are you talking about? This sounds nothing like Sweet Talk Radio. This I won't tell you what this sounds like because you got to become a Patreon member to find out what I really think about the song. The reference to this is a real song intrigued me. I'm not sure what they meant. I don't know if like maybe Sweet Talk Radio was commissioned to make the songs they did tied to Haven. That's why we couldn't find that one song that we mentioned on the Patreon podcast. But it's just an interesting note of them calling one song a real one, unlike saying the Sweet Talk Radio songs weren't real ones. Yeah, those are real songs because most almost everything's on real albums. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was puzzled by that as well. Here's something in the commentary. They mentioned that somebody found in the intro that in that family tree, there's the name Lucy in the family tree during the like montage intro. Did we catch that? Did you in your kind of notes that you took on the intro? I know we didn't mention it in the podcast, but I don't know if you had written it down because we didn't really know Lucy at the time. I thought I, I caught it in there and uh, and I was really focused on uh, kind of the dates uh, you know, f- from the family tree, but I'm pretty sure I caught it. Back, but like I said, that was uh, I did that pretty early in the season. So, well, yeah, because I was episode two uh, for Butterflies when we did that. And Lucy didn't get a name drop until episode three. I'm fairly certain in Harmony. So yeah, Harmony with we probably uh, wouldn't have brought it up, but I just wanted to check if we had that, if we had gotten that in our notes or not. All right. <laughs> so I think that's it for the episode, though. That's <laughs> we have now completed season one. We will be returning to the town beneath the town in t- uh, a little over two weeks. Uh, we're taking a little hiatus between seasons here, kind of how you know Haven takes the summer off or something like that for to to shoot some episodes. Uh We'll be taking a little holiday, a little winter break. But the quickest way to reach us, if you have any questions, is by email. You can contact us at troubledrewatchpod at gmail.com. We want to hear what you guys thought about this season overall, or do you hate our scores, hate our criticism, want us to shut up about fucking Supernatural and American Horror Story? Uh, you can email us there at troubledrewatchpod at gmail.com. Once again, you can find us on Anywhere you listen to your podcast services like Apple, Google, Podcast, Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, Stitcher. Uh, we're also up on YouTube. We're a little behind on Vimeo, but it takes a while for those to come out because of the uh, the download, the upload limit. But uh, it really helps us if you hit subscribe, if you hit the like button and on available services, if you can comment or leave reviews, that uh, always helps us. If you want the podcast straight from the source, you can visit us at troubledpodcast.com. That's our website. We'll have all our episodes, news, announcements, stuff like that. That'll be all there for you. And if you want to follow us on Twitter for updates, you can follow us at Havens Trouble. It's capital H, capital T. Uh, we make funny tweets. Just kidding. Not really. But Eric Balfour and Sam Ernst, you know, they've, they've, they've retweeted. They've liked. They've responded. The word's getting out. <laughs> yeah. Soon enough, maybe Eric Balfour will uh, will come on the show and then eventually listen and then eventually swear to never come back on the show. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we love making the show for you, but there are some costs and we like to upgrade stuff like that Vimeo upload limit. 
And uh, we have a Patreon. We're asking for your help. We're asking you guys to sign up for our Patreon, but we're not leaving you empty-handed if you do. We have three tiers. Our first tier. So when you subscribe to our $1 tier, the Haven Taurus tier, uh, they get you a couple things, the production documents. So my dad was talking about notes he does and how detailed they are. You can find those there. We also give a shout out to everybody who signs up, like Frank and Autumn. And I want to thank Autumn, but uh, did you say Frank? I thought it was litigator lascivious. <laughs> right, because everyone who signs up for at least the $1 tier gets a Wu-Tang nickname made up by us that one was frank's and if you sign up we got another one our three dollar tier is the haven resident tier that one gets you access to our side series troubled with extra syrup so as you've heard us kind of shill for it earlier in the episode we've covered the colorado kid our soundtrack episode where we covered all the licensed music that was used in haven season one uh we pitched our version of joyland the month of January, we're doing a review on Castle Rock, the show that takes place in a Stephen King universe. So we're doing season one just in totality. Uh, I'm sure you'll be like, oh, fuck, I have to listen to them talk about American Horror Story again. I thought we were done with that. Um, <laughs> we'll never be done with it. Yeah. Why do they keep bringing up Arrow? We will be done with that. <laughs> uh, we also have our five dollar tier, which gets you uh, the director's cuts and and a Zoom call with us if you want that we can schedule and we can talk if you want to record and upload it also if you want to like heard by everybody we can do that so just uh we'll be contacting you if you join that tier to set it all up like i said we always want to hear from you guys so go ahead email us tweet at us uh whatever you want to say if you want to just talk about the episodes if you want to like give us n critique on the how we podcast we're open ears so to say goodbye for season one this is alex french and this is uh, Rich French, or as should I say, Enchanter Sick. Um, it's, no, it's Bell Toad Hot. So uh, I want to thank everyone for listening and taking this journey back to Haven with us through all 13 episodes of season one. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And I look forward to you returning for season two, where we'll be coming up with more great content as we watch the episodes. We've already come up with an extra segment for season two, and it's just as stupid as you will think it as you think we would come up with uh, yes. going off our track record <laughs> when, when you when you think we can't come up with anything stupid we will come up with <laughs> something that's even more stupid than you thought was possible but that's what we do we're the frenches so <laughs> once again thank you everyone for listening please come back be safe and remember never let your troubles get you down <laughs>